Hello, uh, welcome to District 3 BioTalk. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing to have you all. We are just, we're gonna start very soon, but uh, before everyone gets into the room or gets uh, online, um, I would like to take the time and uh, explain a little bit about District 3, our BioTalks and uh, what we are doing. Uh, my name is Mazad Sharif Ahmedian. I'm manager of life sciences at District 3. Um, I am a former scientist, entrepreneur, and uh, I have the luxury of working with uh, so many startups, life sciences startups at District 3. Uh, I'm also managing Biohub, the new biotech accelerator of District 3, uh, which I will show you in a, in a second. Uh, it's, um, it's something very exciting that uh, we are opening up very soon. So um, I'm going to move on. I'm going to show you a few slides in case that you don't know what we do at District 3. So by the way, this is my email, mazadadd3center.ca. Feel free to uh, email me. I'm uh, very good in Connecting, connecting you either to our team or if you have, uh, if you need to be connected to our startups, uh, I will be more than happy to do so. Um, yeah, so we have been around, this retreat has been around six, since six years ago. Um, by now, um, we have uh, past the 530 startups. In fact, uh, this is, these are the metrics by 2019. But uh, by now, I know, I know that we are closely to 600 startups that we have supported. Um, in 2019, our startups raised around $18 million. Um, few metrics that we are very proud of. 42% uh, of our startups are founded by females. And uh, 82% of our startups are having uh, immigrant co-founders. So it gives you a little bit of uh, 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 and, and maybe a snapshot of how diverse is our community. And I would say this retreat is the strong core at this retreat is the community. Um, you are a part of it. You will be supported by all the members. Um, we have been, um, Something that I, I need to emphasize on is that uh, we don't take any equity, we don't take any IP. Um, everything is uh, supported through governmental funding and Concordia University. Um, we are also open to other um, institutions, so it's not exclusive to Concordia, but uh, we are supported by Concordia. Also, we are open to general public, so if you are not affiliated to any universities, you are still welcome. So um, we have a somehow, I would say, diverse um, and very large uh, community of uh, life science startups at this retreat. Um, I, at any given time, around 30% of our startups are in life sciences. And from the past slide, you could see we have right now over 100 startups that we are supporting. So. Um, these, this is a snapshot of our current startups. Um, if you know them or some of the, they are very diverse in terms of the, 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 the kind of activities they do. Some are hardware um, companies, they they like affinity instrument. Uh, some are purely AI companies like Plaque, some uh, were active in uh, stem cell therapy, like IntelliSTEM. So, very diverse, but at the same time, I would say a very strong community to support you, depending on uh, if you are in life sciences. So this is the, 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 the this is what I was talking about at the beginning. So the Biohop, which will be open this September, uh, September 2020, um, it's the, uh, the Montreal's first biotech accelerator with laboratory space, co-working space, and also subsidized access to Concordia's Genome Foundry. And uh, if you don't know what is Genome Foundry, um, well, you can always go check Concordia's Genome Foundry, but in general, if you are working in the area of biotech, gene editing, um, uh, and synthetic biology, you should be familiar with Genome Foundries. Uh, these are uh, 
the uh, fully automated uh, technology platforms that you can do um, uh, gene editing uh, completely in, in a very high throughput way and also in, a, uh, in, in, in scales that are good for startups and industries there rather than what is happening in the, in the lab, in a classic research lab. So, so if you're a startup and you want to leverage all the services that this research provides, you also need to make sure that you have validated your startup. 50% um, of the startups uh, fail because they, they are creating something that is good, the technology is perfect, but it's not addressing a need in the market. So beside all the services that District 3 is doing, what, we, what is very important for us is validation. So we have a program uh, to support and help the startups to validate their business model and make sure they are producing something that is needed and will be um, adopted in the market. So validation program uh, is, um, well, we used to do it uh, in person, but now uh, we have switched uh, to online. It's an online program, three months intensive, that will um, give you a good understanding of the, the, of the market, uh, find, helps you to find your, your customers, uh, and also helps you with building your prototype, and also eventually helping you to develop and uh, build your product based on the all the validations you have done from the market to customer and the prototyping technicalities so um, if you want to leverage this opportunity our applications are open in fact the, the program starts in fall so the, the it's your it's your chance to uh, get on board it uh, for the upcoming cohort. So you can go to dtreecenter.ca slash startup and uh, see the form and the, the application form is, is there. So thank you. Well, I'm going to move on to our, our panel today. Um, so Biotox, if you are familiar, if you are one of our members of the community with Biotox, uh, you know that we always invite stakeholders of the ecosystem and uh, create the opportunity to talk about what's going on in life science ecosystem. Um, today we have uh, we, we have uh, Ozan Eisenek, president of Kiritsu Forum uh, of Canada. Uh, and we're going to talk about raising capital and expanding beyond Quebec as a life science startup. So I'm going to briefly uh, introduce Ozan. As I said, hi Ozan. He is the president of Kiritsu Forum, and the uh, Kiritsu Forum is um, the world's largest network of angel investors. Uh, they are um, in the four continents, and uh, they 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 invest on all disciplines, not only life sciences, but at um, in the, uh, when you look at their portfolio, 30% of their, 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 their portfolio are early stage life sciences startups. So um, I'm, I am going to let Ozan to introduce himself, explains us a little bit about his 25 years of experience, and then we move on to questions. All right. Thank you so much, Matia. One second. Let me just uh, share my screen. I have like a couple of slides just to kind of overview. Basically, what you just said in a PowerPoint presentation move. Uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and I will turn this into a, uh, a presentation mode. Uh, so first and foremost, foremost uh, Masad and, uh, and, and D3, thank you for having me as your guest this month. Uh, I hope I'll be able to uh, uh, add some value to, uh, to everybody and to the ecosystem itself. And hopefully we'll be able to engage with, uh, uh, with, with your organizations with the, and with the investor community in Montreal more and more. Uh, hopefully this year, if the pandemic kind of allows us to travel anywhere, it seems, 
uh, but definitely next year as well. Uh, a very brief overview. Uh, my personal background is uh, venture capital and private equity uh, and obviously angel investing. And I've been doing this for a very, very long time. Uh, I'm going to age myself, but since the first dot-com boom, uh, if you even remember when that was. Uh, very quickly on Kretsu Forum. Kretsu Forum is a, a global organization. It's a, it's a network of uh, angel investors. Think of it as a, uh, uh, a, a, an investment network run by investors, so it's, uh, but it's very active. Uh, we are a global network. Uh, we have, uh, you know, chapters all across the world, uh, over 3,000 accredited investors, and you have to be an accredited investor, obviously, to be a part of it, given the nature of the investments that we do, uh, and well over a 1,000 companies that we've funded. We're actually headquartered out of San Francisco, but my business partner and I, we operate the, uh, the, uh, the Canadian chapter. So this is one of the things that we do here in Canada, aside from mergers and acquisitions, private equity, et cetera. Uh, here in Canada. Uh, very quickly, just to give you a kind of a, a footprint of where we are, as you can see within Canada, we have London, Ontario, Toronto. Uh, we've had to break Toronto into two separate regions because it is a, a significant, we may actually have to break it into three or four different regions. Uh, the York region, which is the north of Toronto and the financial district of Toronto. Uh, we have Waterloo and then we have, uh, we have London as is. Uh, so, what do we do here? Uh, our, our, our secret sauce really is to syndicate. Our ability to syndicate across the global network, I'll just go over here, allows us to be able to raise capital, a lot more capital, uh, get in front of so many more investors uh, within a very short period, within the same network, within the same uh, ecosystem. This is how we can actually start and continue to fund uh, angel class deals all the way to the uh, to the uh, to the point where we could actually co-invest with family offices and venture capital firms, and this is why we tend to be a lot of the life sciences heavy as well because they require us uh, these types of companies actually require that type of help uh, throughout their journey. Very quickly, uh, every year we uh, are averaging right now about $110 million of investments globally. Um, we have about three exits every year. So because we've been going, you know, you don't just have an exit every, you know, if you invest into a company every two years. Uh, it takes some time and it's taking longer and longer and longer uh, for us to realize these types of exits. But uh, we have about three or four exits every year. Uh, but uh, in general, around the $110 million mark of, uh, of investments, and that is slowly growing, um, uh, as, as it should be, as we grow the network. Uh, so what are we investing into? As Mazad uh, pointed out, we are sector agnostic. Uh, we'll invest into everything. We'll invest into carpeting, uh, into you know plants, you name it, you got it. Uh, however, we're looking for innovation within these sectors. Uh, we will not invest into just a regular hairdresser, but we may invest into a hairdressing product where they can actually develop and you know expand throughout the world. A way to really make sectors efficient. Life sciences comprises thirty to thirty-five percent of our investment technology another 25 but these types i saw a question pass by just before when you were masa when you were talking you know does a mobile communication app fall into the life sciences category well it falls into the technology category but it actually can fall into the life sciences as well because you can slice and dice this thing to anything you want uh and it's really okay because everybody has a niche everybody has a nuance uh if your business model is good scalable that's where we can actually help you grow. Um, uh, unlike D3, we are actually, we do take equity. <laughs> so we're pretty much purely private. Uh, so we, we obviously, there are different government programs that you can kind of feed off of, but we are private. Uh, we are private investors uh, and we will go in, in, in various different structures depending on where your company is. So I, at the beginning, I told you that, you know, we're the most active. It's not just me saying it. It's not just Ozan, hey, we're the most active. It's actually according to PitchBook. So uh, PitchBook, as you can see from this list, you know, there are other names, this is Y Combinator, 500 Stars, Andrezine, all these companies. We don't advertise, but we are very, very active. 
uh, PitchBook is really the, uh, the industry watchdog based out of the US. Uh, and our numbers are just coming in uh, for, for this quarter as well through, uh, through PitchBook. So uh, we are active. Uh, we do a lot of different investments. We do a lot of different types of investments. Uh, and, uh, and we're really looking for the best business models and the best people to invest into. Oh, one more slide. I'm going to make it very quick. Uh, within Canada, 60% of our deal flow, and that's becoming less and less, it's, it's now almost 50-50. Uh, is, is, is Canadian. What is Canadian? It's coast to coast. It's not just Quebec. It's not just Ontario. It's coast to coast. Uh, coast uh, Canada is local for us. And uh, the remaining 40 to 50% of our deal flow that we invest into is international. That's non-Canadian. Uh, and all of these companies fly into Toronto uh, on their own dime uh, and they present and they fly back over to Seattle. They fly to uh, to uh, you know Mumbai. They fly to Stockholm uh, to get in front of angel investors and family offices. And this is how you grow your own company ecosystem. This is how you can actually take your company uh, uh, to a next round and a next round and a next round. And that's what we do: syndication. Uh, a very quick brief overview of some of the uh, companies that we've just very recently invested into. You'll see Laurent over here. Uh, it's, it started out here in Canada. We syndicated it out to the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic region, Philadelphia, New York. They then went over to Seattle. They've raised, I think, over uh, 4 million or so. I don't want to, I don't know. There's another one, Ovensa over here. That's another one from Montreal uh, that we went into. Uh, so they're, uh, they're, they're going through some uh, interesting transactions as well. Uh, all throughout through. This is a cross section of just some of the stuff that we've recently done here in Toronto. And that's it. I just want to open up the questions, I guess, uh, Mazad. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, it's fantastic um, what the, the forum is doing. Um, so maybe I should start with the, uh, with a question more specific to life sciences. Um, you have 25 years of experience in investing. Uh, you did your math. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm wondering, um, how, do you, uh, how do you define the difference between a life science, investment in life sciences uh, yeah. versus the other fields? So, uh, you know, I get asked that question quite often. It's, um, uh, it's way to look at life sciences, and it's always it's the, the, the usual knee-jerk answer from everybody else is that it's very difficult to invest into the life sciences sector, et cetera. Well, it is and it isn't. Uh, you have to have a different point of view as an investor into the life sciences. Um, the investing into a life sciences doesn't necessarily, so if you, if you invest into a product, right? This is like a phone. If you invest into a phone or like a product, they have different moments or points of time where you could actually realize returns. Right, that differs in a life sciences company. So, as an investor, we have to take a different point of view on when to expect any type of a return and what those milestones are. I honestly, uh, many of the times that we uh, that that we or that I personally, I don't come from the life sciences sector, but I have in my own personal portfolio have life sciences companies. Uh, when you're talking to the angel community you're talking to a broad range. And as, as angels, you need to know that we are piggybacking on fellow angels. So the only reason that I would get into another life sciences company is because I know who is in that company, who is invested into that company. So it's not really a, uh, a matter of, oh my, it's so difficult to invest into a life sciences. I don't know what's going on. It's a perspective issue, I think. And as investors, we're still in a learning curve that, you know, we need to look at life sciences in a different, different light. But really, if you look at the statistics, sorry, if you look at the statistics, uh, returns on life sciences tend to be greater than returns on certain products. So it's interesting that way. So as you said, the, um, normally cycles are pretty long for, for life sciences startups to meet their milestones. Um, so what do you exactly want to see when a life science entrepreneur is presenting to you? Because uh, 
by nature they 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 have uh, it, it's going to take longer for them mm -hmm. to to reach the milestones what should they present to be I interesting for for investors especially angel investors mm -hmm. It's not necessarily longer. Uh, actually, the, the, uh, we know exactly where like, so if it's a pharma, we know it's a clinical phase one, phase two, we know when to exit, we know it's, it's you know, it's, you can actually plan that out. Uh, and you can actually plan out a, uh, a, 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 the, the size of the rounds that you require throughout that, you know, three year, four year, whatever journey. Um, Science is science. So we do rely on some of our investors that actually understand the science. Uh, but at the end of the time, just like in every other sector that we look into, you need to surround yourself with the right people. Uh, if you're, if many of the companies that you guys deal with, they're, you know, in commercialization stage, right? They're coming out of R and D work from the, uh, from the university, from you know, local organizations. Uh, who you circle that research with is very important. People who've actually taken these types of products throughout the, uh, the, the regulatory process, people who've actually exited a life sciences company, though that is the trick and that's usually the bottleneck. Uh, that's one of the business bottlenecks that some of these companies hit and they just don't know who and how to sell uh, uh, to exit. So we have the science we need to circle ourselves with the right people. And that's what we really look at. And we, I want to know uh, the business prospect, where a realistic business opportunity and a realistic uh, way of exit. And I want to know the guy who's going to execute that exit. Uh, and that's those things that we put a lot of value in, especially in a life sciences company. Thank you. So, um... I know Carrizo is not only is not only providing funding, but you also provide support and a network of experts when it's needed. So you you create an, a network of support around your universities. Um, so this is a, the as one of my colleagues likes to say, that a lot of love to give to your uh, to your portfolio. Not love. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so. Um, yeah, so um, I'm wondering how long the process would take from someone comes to present um, to you, they come to Toronto, and then well, the, what is the process until they the can... This is relatively easy, uh, and I think, you know, uh, many of the companies should pay a lot more attention before they come to us, or at least when they do come to us, we could actually, you know, hold them by the hand and really kind of guide them, is the structure of the deal. Structure of the deal is very, very important. And I'll give you an example. It, it, honestly, uh, it, it, many of the companies that come to us, you know, if, if they do have due diligence in hand, if it's just a basic revision, it'll take about a month, two months for us to start investing into. Uh, if they do not, then it may take a little longer. Uh, but the deal structure is incredibly important. And I'll give you an example. One of the companies that came out of our uh, Mid-Atlantic region called Immunomic Therapeutic, uh, we structured the deal where, you know, we had licensing, uh, uh, licensing rights. Um, and, and, and they, um, uh, it's a pharma company. Uh, we struck a deal and this is the, 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 this is the value of the network. This is where the value of the network really comes into play. Uh, we struck a $300 million uh, licensing deal with, uh, with a pharma out of Japan, you guys may know. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that, that was primarily distributed to all of the investors. We still hold our full 100% of our share equity but we got a, uh, a 16 X, you know, return on our, uh, on our money. So structuring the deal right up front is absolutely critical for these companies. It's not, it doesn't, it's not just a simple, let's do an equity offering uh, or let's do a convertible debt. Uh, you need to be creative here uh, and you need to work with the investors. And if you have the right network behind you, uh, you need to leverage it. Just don't leverage the money, leverage the network. I see. Thank you. Um, so um, my next question is going to be a bit challenging. 
Is there something, is there something about investing, especially on life sciences startups that you believe in, but your fellow investors find it challenging or they may uh, not agree with you? That's the whole point of this whole like angel asset class. <laughs> it's disagreeing. Uh, I, listen, I've seen, uh, I've seen companies that I thought were just trash, ridiculous that received so much money. And I've seen companies that, uh, that I thought were, wow, they're going to hit it out of the park. They didn't. Right. Uh, so, uh, at the end of the day, I'm not saying this is betting, but at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, there is a, there is an investor for pretty much every company and it's how you position your business model. Uh, and it's how you execute that business model. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, was it, whether it's a short term look or a long term look, a lot of people look at, you know, so some people, uh, they want to go in for the longer term, right? Uh, some of the deals that, uh, that, that we get into, I get into it, it's more shorter term. Uh, I want the next round of VCs to take me out uh, because, or take, uh, take our group out. And why is that? Is because we're angels. We took the risk. I want to get out. Now that doesn't necessarily add a lot of value to the company because it's a share transfer to the VC, but at the same time, VC gets it at the discount, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody's happy, clean up the cap table, all that stuff. So some people say, you know what, that's going to impede the growth of the company. As an investor, I'm like, well, you know what, I already helped the company grow. I may as well exit. So it, it's, they, these are all points where you, uh, as a CEO of a company, you need to really keep an eye out and really keep an open mind uh, so that you, you, can, you can, and be very flexible uh, on how you approach and how you structure the right deal for your own company and for yourself too. It's not just for the company, it's for the people in the company, right? All right. Um, so, um Maybe I, I refer to what you just said, uh, not this question, the one before. Um, you said entrepreneurs should be leveraging the network of investors. Um, what will be the, the what will be the, the 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 good practice for an entrepreneur to build that relationship? Um, not to be considered as um, I mean to keep that network or relationship alive and uh, leverage it more and more. Uh, what do you suggest? Uh, it is a relationship, and at the end of the day, it becomes uh, uh, like a, it can become a personal relationship because you know when you're talking with the different things. You know, when an angel class is different because you're dealing with individuals, BCs, family offices. It's a little different than that. It's more slightly more institutional, but that there's the, the line between the two are disappearing um, by the, uh, like every year. Uh, it's 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 about and it's not uh, when i talk about a relationship i mean this is a, like a, a, it's it is tough love i mean it's not uh it's it can be very uh um uh confrontational at some point uh because uh you know people have different agendas right an investor will probably have a different agenda than the ceo of the company uh believe it or not um uh, so I find that companies that are reporting that are meeting their milestones uh, tend to get a lot more of the attention of investors, uh, more hands-on. Um, companies that are upfront and they don't, you know, shock investors with a, uh, a, a, a report that just comes out completely negative. Co uh, CEOs that are open and willing to reach out to the investors and say, hey, you know what? There's a problem here. There's a challenge. It may affect the next reporting period. Uh, we need to fix this now so that it doesn't have the... We're here to help. We're not here to sit back and just hang out. You know, you have my phone number. Just give me a call. If I can't answer it, I won't. I'll guide you to the right person. So that's the type of relationship. That's how CEOs can really help, uh, help, their, help themselves and help their company. Uh, and that's how you really build that relationship. Just, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a professional, uh, it's a professional way of building a network, uh, and then leveraging that network, uh, for the company. It's in my interest that your company does well, right? At the end of the day, I'm here to help you. 
uh, not to uh, push you into a corner. Yes, for sure. I mean, the, this is a great perspective. I, I think um, startups, especially at the early stages, they kind of like have hard time of transitioning to building that relationship. Um, but um, I guess, as you also mentioned, um, especially in life sciences, having more and more investors that are familiar with the field and can uh, contribute not only on the investment but also bringing more network or expertise um, mm. that's something and, much needed and uh and i'll stress this again we were talking about it before the uh, uh before the, uh, the things uh, engage with private investors uh it's the you you want to leverage the private network not government networks uh, government networks will help you to a point uh, and it's there for a reason to actually you know uh, help these companies facilitate it uh, but the driver needs to be the private investor uh, and the private company uh, otherwise I see a lot of companies spinning wheels uh, just you know more government more government more government more government where's the private how are you gonna get where are you gonna exit you're gonna exit in private Right, you're not going to exit into a government, uh, but why are you still with you know just completely dependent on government? You need to engage with the private community, private investment community. Yeah, well, that's a very interesting point. In fact, we had um, a couple of days ago, or almost um, a week ago, we had this news that government of Quebec is unifying all the technology transfers and the money that the tech transfer offices provide for commercialization of technologies. Uh, it's going to be in a completely different format, more in terms of bringing um, partnership with private sector and industries than just support from the government to commercialize your research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It needs to be diverse. Uh, it needs to be diverse. I mean, this is how you build an ecosystem, right? It's not just, so for example, D3, right? Uh, you're one part of the broader ecosystem and there needs to be more d3 type organizations that interact compete with each other to really kind of drive deal flow uh and that's how you build a uh, you know you I, 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 these are personal opinions obviously that you know i'm not a, i'm not one to uh consolidate ecosystems uh within this particular investment ecosystem i think diversification or uh, uh, choices are very important competition is incredibly important here and that will drive quicker commercialization uh and that will drive not just the quicker commercialization but products from quebec to reach outside from around the world much much uh you know much more efficiently for sure yes. but that's just a personal opinion no, uh, <laughs> many people I agree with you. So, um, so um, I since you have been working, I mean, um, personally and also through the career, so you have been seeing the, the the investment ecosystem around the world. What do you suggest to entrepreneurs, Canadian entrepreneurs that are looking for funding out of Canada? Um, there is a trend that uh, these days um, startups prefer to stay in Canada to use the, the, the privileges of like you know, the, uh, less um, labor cost or tax return that they can receive, but they look for funding outside of Canada. Um, but there are the, the support system within Canada as well. How do you see that? You know what? Uh, an investment comes in so many different shapes, sizes, and structures. Uh, don't, you have to keep an open mind. Uh, you really do. Um, uh, I, I'm seeing some of the uh, questions over here or if somebody comes in, do, do they charge money? Those are small things. You're running a company. Uh, listen, if one of the guys who exited three companies to a Pfizer comes to your door and asks for money to consult, take it. Don't be afraid to leave Canada. If somebody from Hong Kong says, you know what, uh, you want to meet this VC, don't pay 5,000 bucks and go to Hong Kong personally. We have to keep an open. If you're going to nickel and dime yourself to a corner, an angel investor or any type of investor is going to raise that flag and you're, you're out of the game. 
you are completely out of the game. Uh, you need to keep an open mind. You need to be very flexible and you need to be very uh, 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 creative in how you engage, uh, not just with the investors, but with all the different support uh, mechanisms out there. Um, and, and you need to be global. Uh, you really need to be global. You have to have a global perspective. And why do you think we were able to take a company from Philadelphia and get a licensing deal out of Japan? Impossible. If that company was just, oh no, my focus is only now in you know Philadelphia or Quebec. I want to get the Quebec you know uh, hospital chains right now before I move out. No, you know what? There's a hospital chain that's a thousand times bigger across the world. You know, take advantage of that. Uh, don't just spread your resources too thin so you can't do anything, but you need to keep an open mind. Don't nickel and dime yourself to a corner. Don't uh, don't structure the deal so that it, it hurts your second, third, fourth round. Uh, and that's why having the right deal structure at the beginning is so important uh, and circling yourself with the right people is so, so very important here. Yeah, absolutely. Thinking global is uh, it's something that we suggest to our startups, that especially life sciences. Just think that you are a global company from the day one. Um, that, that that's going to bring you more success. Um, so this is going to be my last question before we um, we go through the, the questions from the attendees. Um, to the, the to the audience, please uh, submit your questions. We're going to move on to your questions in a in, in a in few minutes. Um, so, I want to know how COVID has affected the investment uh, to your network. Yeah, uh, is well. First of all, how how things have changed, if anything has changed uh, in terms of investment and how you consider portfolios. Uh, com companies into your portfolios and also if any new trends of technologies have become more interesting for for investors mm -hmm. yeah uh well one of the things that we need to do is you know business continuity um and and we need to make sure that you know this is we this is a temporary uh you know temporary kind of challenge and i hope that we don't have we don't see worse and worse type similar types of challenges uh and hopefully we're learning from it um uh but uh when it comes to uh individual businesses this is a uh, an exercise in continuity and and you know you cannot have a challenge like this uh an artificial kind of you know something that's out of your uh out of your uh scope uh you know uh, bring a company down one of the things that we're doing is is really helping our existing portfolio of companies go through it uh, either through investments sustainability etc so we're kind of doubling down in an effect um, uh, on some of the portfolio companies making sure that at the end they come out stronger uh, maybe consolidated maybe you know whatever that whatever it may be whatever it looks like uh, that it turns out uh, there are other certain sectors, such as you know, the telemedicine. It's always, always been out there, always been out there, and all of a sudden now it's just a, uh, you know, it, it just spike up uh, in importance, right? So the companies that we had put money into before, they're they're doing well. There's a lot more companies that are coming out. Oh, we're doing this, that, and stuff. Those are they, they will stay. Uh, they, some of them will stay. Some of the new technologies and new practices will stay after this uh, COVID. Um, but you know, as with every sector, it goes up and plateaus, and then we have a consolidation. It'll go through that as well. Um, like I said, it's sped up the, uh, the development of certain sectors. Uh, it slowed certain other sectors. But uh, you know, life goes on. We have to uh, make sure that uh, that that you know we continue to you know allocate money. Yeah, it's a strange time, but as you said, only those that uh, plan for for long term they stay and they. Uh... We have to adapt. We must adapt. What it is is what it is. The, the, you know, it's uh, we can't we can't look out the window and complain about it. We have to adapt. Uh, that's the only re that's the only way. It's not easy, and especially it's not easy if you're a CEO right now and you're you know you're struggling with a couple of people, employees, five, ten employees, and you're like, oh boy. 
no income, no nothing, no revenue, no nothing. What do I do now? So we just need to make sure that we pull through. Uh, and this is where the network comes into play. This is where you, you know, reach back out and right now, rather than later say, Hey, you know what? There may be a problem. Uh, it's uh, solve the problems now. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. But now we're going to move on to questions from attendees. Someone has asked, what is stage of life sciences startup going to be interesting for you? Um, or in other, in their term, it's too early for you that you wouldn't consider. Uh, we, we usually do not go into the, uh, like the pre-commercialization, commercialized, like we won't invest into R and D. Uh, that's just too early for us. And I think that's, you know, there's a, there's a group of investors that focus in on that certain family offices, for example, they love that space. That's where they make the biggest value jump. Um, and, and I see that, but you need a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, focus and expertise and, and you know, the, the number of deals then just drops down to like, you know, one, two a year, uh, for some of these family offices. Uh, so we're looking at companies that, you know, are, are getting into their clinical uh, at the earliest stage and then phase one. And, you know, we sometimes do see phase two by that time we're out. Okay. There was actually we're out sometimes on, on the IPO. So there are a couple of instances where we IPO. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, um, can you share what has been your most successful investment? You get the ups and downs. Uh, I'd rather tell you the worst ones. Okay. Uh, who cares about the, the most successful ones? And the worst ones are really, you know, when you don't have any money, you just, you come into zero. Uh, there are even worse ones than that, you know, when, when CEOs actually commit fraud, things like that. So uh, then, then there are legal implications. Uh, but, you know, that, this, is a, this is a rocky road. And this is, you know, we need to be flexible in... in, in in, uh, in trying to save the investments that we've done and trying to save the companies uh, and CEOs as well. So yeah, the, it, uh, I have war stories. That's, you know, it's, it's, that's, what, that's what builds the sector, uh, not the one or two success stories. Okay. Uh, someone has asked, how do you structure the deal? Or maybe I change it to like, how much it should be done on the, the, the it should be a structure on, on the entrepreneur entrepreneur side and how much uh, will be evolved uh, with your team? The entrepreneur should be very involved because uh, we, we, one, thing, one thing for certain is that there's another round coming after our round. All right, that's a given. Nobody, like if you come into me, it's like, oh, you're the last round. I'm, I just need one round. That's, that's very tough to believe. Uh, it happens, but it's very tough to believe, especially in the life sciences. So there's going to be different rounds where you need to finance. And, uh, and it's very, very important that you structure all the way at the beginning uh, a way for, uh, for investors to gain value on the next round and the next round so that they double down. The worst thing you want to do, and this is the biggest, op the, the biggest frustration that I see, is that these companies are coming in and... Uh, I know there are government people on them. They come in from these government organizations that have gotten grants and their, their valuation is sky high. Uh, and then I can't, as a private investor, we can't even go have meet halfway. And let's say if we do, if you value your, this is, this is baby steps, right? You grow, you grow, you grow. Uh, this isn't a giant leap to the end. Right. Uh, and, 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 and such, you need to value your company so that your next round of uh, capital raise does not push you down below that and everybody takes a haircut and nobody supports you again. The structure of that is mission critical. Uh, right at the beginning, make sure that you have the right mechanisms. If you're doing options, you have the right legal uh, advice that it's not just some you know, vanilla download from a government organization that on uh, a term sheet, these are, the, the, it can get very, especially when you start getting into the institutional rounds where they start asking you to clean up cap tables, et cetera, things like that. And if you've not really kind of documented, it will come back. It will come back. Start everything nice and fresh, spend an extra 5,000 bucks. You don't have to break the bank for it. Uh, and in fact, throw it onto the, uh, the shoulders of the investors. Say, guys, you know what? 
can you please structure this so that we can make a, a perfect round two, round three, series A, series B, et cetera. Uh, leverage the investor. And I said, keep, keep an open mind. It's not just a convertible debt, a safe or an equity. It could be a hybrid. It could be something. You've got to be creative on this. All right. Thank you. There is a question about, um, is there any area that you are uh, interested in or do more investment in, in life sciences? No, no, there's no, I mean, if, if, if the question is like, I, am I focusing in it? Are we focusing? No, we don't focus in into any one particular part of life sciences. We've had, like I said, we've had uh, the uh, members invest into, uh, into, uh, you know, technology communications uh, to pharma, to uh, insurance, like medical, like you name the, on the finance part. Uh, it's really a, uh, uh, it's really across the board. Uh, it's, it's about the business and it's about the people. Yeah. Um, so some questions are very specific. Somebody explained the technology and was wondering if you are interested in that technology to invest on. But I, I tried to ask the questions that are more general. Um, yeah. So um, you explained about um, having a great team, um, technology, but when you are reviewing a, 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 a startup to, to invest in, um, is there something that you haven't mentioned uh, that uh, you will consider as, an, as, a, as a good point to, or a strong point for, for a startup to be invested on? So beside the team, the technology, um, being already connected to the network. I mean, just, you know, having it thought through, uh, you know, this is, these are, you know, having a good, good plan, an understandable plan, uh, the financial forecast should be, you know, it's, it's, it really comes down to the business and who can execute it. Can, can this person really execute or not? Uh, and generally we do see a transition in management, uh, when a company reaches a certain stage, uh, and, and I think most CEOs should be ready for something like that. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, a messy transition, uh, especially when the VCs come in, uh, and when the institutionals come in, that's when really can, that's when you really need to sit down and, you know, change what your company looks like and how it operates. Uh, so there are different dynamics and we have to, and there's so many different variables. Honestly, uh, if 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 we knew all of them, I wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> all right, uh, no, everybody would be rich. Uh, so it's uh, uh, but there, it's just you have to pick the right companies that you think you can support. Yeah. So um, um, this is a question. that's kind of like it's uh, it's all over in the, several questions. Um, how do you see the, the, the for for early stage companies? Um, how do you define the difference between going after VC funding or angel funding? Do you see any difference, or w which one you suggest? Yeah. For uh, so, I mean, you need to. It's it's tough when you're focusing in on your company. It's tough to then refocus on who 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 what investment community is looking for, right? And you just it's really difficult. And this is where kind of like organizations like D three comes into play, where you can actually guide them to the right type of investors. Uh, and it's, like I said, there's there's uh, um, uh, what is clean up the cap table? I'll answer that next. Uh, <laughs> it's it's from a very early uh, entrepreneur. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, you need to you, you you need to look at different aspects. Uh, now I lost the track uh, my uh, my my track of mine here. Uh, so we wanted to know your opinion and uh, like. And then really a stage of startup. Oh, right. Um, who should they should? So there's certain family offices, like I said, there's certain family offices here in Toronto even um, that, that focus only on funds that focus only on the R and D part. They they pick out uh, they pick out R and D projects from universities and they 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 will invest into that. The first hundred, first two fifty, whatever. Um, and then afterwards they work with us to facilitate the first angel round. So, but we then co-invest. If they lead it, then we 
then we follow on or they, then we kind of piggyback on it. Uh, so there are those types of investors out there. So everybody, most of the family offices, especially most of the venture capital, uh, they all have mandates. Uh, you need to be wary of their mandates. Sometimes they, they literally won't touch anything below a series A, right? Uh, and what is a series A? It really kind of depends on which part of the world you come in, you're coming in from. Uh, it's, I think companies should rely on organizations such as ours and D3 and similar types of organizations so that, because they have a better understanding of the investment ecosystem, they'll be able to guide them to the right investor, not to the wrong investor. You don't want to be pitching your company to some investor that has no, that just, mandate, that it's impossible for them to invest. Right, so you need to do some homework, but I suggest my biggest uh, recommendation is that you know you you lean on these types of organizations like the Kretsus and like the D3s, so that they can guide you in the right direction to the right investment communities, uh, and, and clean up the cap table. Basically, is how many shareholders do you have? So if you have like you know uh, 38 different shareholders and a venture capital comes in, 38 different shareholders, 38 different line items on your uh, on your cap table, capitalization table. Uh, when a VC comes in, they want, they want a clean one. They don't want to be messing, like, you know, if somebody, somebody invested, your uncle invested $10,000 three years ago and somebody else had $50,000 on a different valuation. You have all of these options, plans, this and that. And then when the VC comes in, they would like to clean that up a little bit. And this is where an opportunity from the angels are. You know what? Clean me up, no problem. I'm willing to exit. I'll take a discount from your current valuation that the VC is getting. The VC is happy, right? VC is like, wow, I just got a 10, 20% discount. Uh, I'm happy because I just exited for me or else I'm like, oh my God, am I going to get diluted some more? What's going to happen, right? So uh, you clean up the ta cap table that way uh, and you consolidate, you buy them out, etc. cetera. Um, there's a question about um, your referring to your, your words uh, that, um, anyway, if they're offering you money, go and take the money. Um, but uh, what are the pitfalls? Uh, the, there are pitfalls. So what do you, what, uh, from entrepreneur perspective, what should they be careful about when they are offered um, money by investors? Uh, so there, when, when very few times, all, some, some of the emerging markets, so if you go into China, uh, if you go into different uh, things, the so, so way it works is that, you know, what Chinese investors will see you, uh, whether you're in, you know, Shenzhen or wherever, uh, they'll see you. And I've seen some, and they'll come in with their own term sheet. They're like, you know what, I'm going to give you $5 million or $10 million. Here's my term sheet. You need legal advice at that point. <laughs> All right. Um, in North America, generally speaking, in the in the angel asset class, uh, you can actually work through the terms. Uh, when I say take the money, I don't mean just take the money. Uh, all money is taken on term sheets, uh, and all term sheets are negotiable. All of them are negotiable. Uh, so if you see clauses, if you see something, because the one thing you don't want as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, is that you have, uh, one round, six investors, they all come in at different term sheets. That will be a messy, messy cleanup, cleaning up the cap table, uh, when an institutional comes in. So try to see if you can consolidate that term sheet and have everybody participate on those same very terms, right? Don't just but take the money, that's, everything comes with strings attached. Nobody's going to just give you money. Uh, that just doesn't exist, that's a fairy tale. Uh, um, but uh, make sure that your terms are solid. And, and, and this is where legal advice comes in. I, I strongly uh, suggest that you have uh, a legal counsel to look at it. Like I said, you're not going to break the bank here for uh, one of the one of the law firms looking over your term sheet and just to making sure that you know that that you know that, that you're not being pushed into a corner. All right, thank you. Um, there's a question about um, when. What are the the similar mistakes or 
uh, weaknesses that you see in, in entrepreneurs when they, they, when they approach you for investment? Like, um, is there, are, they, are they all good or there is something that you see the same trend that they should be seeing all and they should be working on? Uh, some of the challenges? Uh, challenges or in more in terms of preparation to present to, to investors. Oh, right on the, on the, uh, the preparation to, uh, you know, uh, so first of all, the terms are very, the structure of the deal is incredibly important. And I think the investors, if you're, if you're open to the investors, if this is your first round coming out and if you're, if you're open to them and say, you know what, we have a term, sheet. don't ever, don't ever come in front of the investor saying that I don't have a term sheet you provide, I can provide you with a term sheet. I can guarantee you it's not in your interest. <laughs> guarantee you 100%. Uh, but come in with a term sheet, at least something thought through and say, you know what, we're open to negotiation. That's something. Try not to come in with, you know, with some spectacular uh, valuation that's unreachable. Uh, you know, that's not, that, that, that's not the way to start a negotiation. Uh, that's not a way to start a business relationship right at the end of the day uh come in with open arms because some some like i said an investment can come in in many different forms uh you know an investment can come in the form of listen you're looking for uh you, i i see in your line item you're looking for ip development 85 nine, 120 thousand dollars worth you know what as an ip lawyer i can actually provide you with all that work ip this and that but i want equity in return you know what? Those are things that you can click off your line item on your on your uh, on your capital raise. Those are things that you could actually really you know keep an open mind uh, and 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 really kind of because on the angel class you're 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 pitching to a guy who owns a textile factory and a guy who's exited four life sciences pharma companies to you know from around the world at the same time, right? Uh, so you. Just don't, you don't, you need to be uh, uh, not too science focused, but not too, uh, not too, not too broad with a good, good deal in your hand. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It shows that how much they, they should be prepared and educated on like how they, they, they should approach you. And, uh... and help us help you. I mean, uh, for example, with Kurtz Reform, uh, one of our processes is to actually position you before you get up uh, to present. So when, after you pass all the deal screenings and all that stuff, we will have multiple sessions with the company to slide by slide, like literally, like, you know, I don't like this slide over here, that, that detail before they start presenting. Uh, and we will, you know, we will help you position that. And you should expect that. You should expect that from every organization that you go to. Uh, because, you know, you're, you're, this is, you're, 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 you're putting the time, effort, and sometimes your money to, you know, to go through the whole process, uh, you need to take something out of it. And if it's, you know, you need to get as much value as possible. This is what the good CEO can leverage. Uh, you don't just focus on it, but you could actually, you know, delegate it, leverage it, do somehow, and then boom, it happens. And that's where you can actually multitask things like this. Uh, it's not rocket science, honestly, it's not rocket science. You just need people who've done this before to just kind of guide you through the system. Yeah, so um, we are already past the time. Um, thank you so much, Ozan. Um, I try to read the questions that are more general, so um, it could be beneficial for everyone, but um, there are some uh, more specific questions. Sorry if we didn't have, we didn't have time to go through your questions. Um, thank you very much, Ozan. That was um, I, I appreciate your energy and your passion, the way you you are. Uh, I guess the, the the people have a kind of mixed feeling about approaching investors, but seeing people like you that you are open to uh, giving information, supporting entrepreneurs, it's uh, something our entrepreneurs yeah, much can, uh, much yeah, needed. It, it can be very intimidating approaching investors. You shouldn't be intimidated. This is your company. Uh, this is your future. You know what? Worst thing they can say is no. What then? Who cares? All right. Just it's easy. It's uh, make it easy. And that's 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 my that would be my message. 
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, see you, some of you startups uh, approaching to Kirito Forum or coming to District 3. Don't All forget right. the validation program. Thank you, Azan. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you so much, Mazat. Thank you.